Continuing our series on which campaign you should play for Total War Saga Troy, today we'll be covering the new Amazonian DLC that was released a handful of months ago. If you'd like to watch the coverage on either the Danaeans or the Trojans, you can find that link in the upper right corner and at the end of this video. But in this video, we'll be talking about Hippolyta as well as Penisleia. If you've never watched one of these on my channel before, or if you've never heard me butcher a Greek name like that, the way I like to do this is giving you a spoiler-free rundown of each character. I'll boot their campaign up on turn one, we'll talk about the mechanics of each campaign, while also going over some other unique elements of that playthrough. Then lastly, I'll give you a rundown saying essentially, you know, hey, if you decide to start this campaign, expect it to play in this style. Or if you're interested in using a lot of a specific type of unit, this is going to be the campaign for you, you know, so on and so forth. Something of that sort at the very end that at least gives you a sense of uh, what that campaign moves towards. This is not a guide. And, I, and while I might give you a few tips here and there, the ultimate goal here is to help you decide which campaign you should play in Total War Saga Troy. If you end up enjoying the video though, please don't forget to like, comment, and or subscribe as each one of those helps me out to some varying degree. But let's get started on this guide to the Amazons and whether or not it's the campaign for you. First off, we're going to talk about Hippolyta, and of the two, this one plays most conventionally as far as the other characters in Troy thus far. If you've played anything else, this is again going to feel very much at home. But we get two new faction mechanics here with Initiation Rites and the Amazon Kingdom. Amazon Kingdom is pretty cool, it essentially is this... Um, currency that you'll discover across the map and we're going to go into a little bit and initiation rights is a really awesome way to essentially upgrade your units um, it makes the game very challenging but at the same time really cool also when it comes to hippolyta herself she is a, an archer so as thus she does not get access to the defenders but she gets access to fighters as well as warlords and then her unique faction units are the followers of artemis which are a bow infantry unit that i think Almost everyone gets access to a mythological. I have to double check that, but uh, it was, I think, at one point only an Amazonian thing, and you had to pray to Artemis to even be able to recruit them. But they're very strong. They have a volley ability here. They've got Inspire Fierce Resolve. They have Forest Fighter, Hide in Forest, and then Shoot While Moving. Also, we get the, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, it is an uh, archer cavalry unit, so they'll be able to fire whilst moving and do quite a bit of damage. And that is going to be Hippolyta's focus, is really going to be horse archers. That's really the name of the game for her. Then lastly, we get this Aristomachoi, which are awesome sword and shield infantry units that you can upgrade th through the initiation rites. Let's swing into her campaign and take a look at some things on a little bit more detail. Okay, so here we are in Hippolyta. Not Hippolyta. Even though I've started this campaign, I X'd my way through the opening. Did not know it was Hippolyta, my bad guys. So Hippolyta's campaign, and she starts in a pretty cool, fun location in the southern portion of the map. One of the only other people outside of Sarpedon who starts all the way down over in this region. So with her mechanics, we get two new ones, right? That first one here is the Amazonian Kingdoms. And when we select this, we essentially have these special little um, milestones that we can do. Heritage, Enlighten, Wisdom, Authority, and Legacy. And you can see that it requires quite a bit. It requires Amazonian treasure and then some sort of food cost or wood, stone, so on and so forth. But each one of these will do a little cool thing here. So for Heritage, the first one, gives a unit an increase in rank, costs Amazon treasures based on its current experience. Then as we go forward, gives a hero an increased rank. Then we've got Wisdom, which will instantly complete a started royal decree. So right as soon as you hit Wisdom, you start to get a pretty steep power sweep upward on these things because that is a very strong one to be able to unlock. Once you unlock the Milestone, You'll be able to just do these very frequently and it's quite nice so as we jump to the next one authority enables the ability to grant an exotic gift during diplomacy that will affect a single negotiation so if you're really trying to push for a specific alliance a specific barter agreement i mean it's really going to help you out a ton now lastly here we have legacy instantly upgrades a main settlement building costs amazon and treasures it's particularly good right especially because that is probably the biggest resource sink in the game are those main settlement building upgrades this allows you to mitigate that pretty nicely and how you get access to that is one of two ways you can get this little guy right here this sacred site it produces a small amount of amazon treasure 
Then the other way is kind of the same way is this guy right here. This is a sacred site. It produces a large amount of Amazon treasures each turn. So if it's got a silver icon, small amount. If it has a gold icon, it gives a large amount. Then you have got this, which of course just denotes that there are unique buildings. Now there are also epic missions and the such that um, you can complete that will also add to your Amazon treasures. And the nice thing here is these are gonna gain, be gained per turn. As you can see, they're right up here. Perform feats, improving the army, settlements, and diplomatic negotiations. Amazon treasures are gathered in sacred settlements and sacred sites. So as you um, kind of gather these up across the map, if you still take a look at just the starting location, you've got one here, you've got one here, you've got one here, you've got one here, and those are going to give you access to those treasures to get access then to the milestones. Now, the other ability that the other Amazonian also shares is the initiation rights. This is pretty sweet, and they both have different initiation rights. So for... Um, Hippolyta's, I almost said Hippolyta again, for Hippolyta's campaign, she is focused way more on archers. In fact, she starts with archers, which is quite strong in Total War Saga Troy. No, I think the only other person that starts with archers is Paris. I can't remember off the top of my head, but she starts with the ability to summon or summon to recruit Amazonian archers from the start. And then you'll be able to progress them up to this next tier. Same thing with all the other units, as you can see the little lines that denote where they can go. And after that, they can go to the third tier. But what has to happen is, let me hover over the, the uh, chosen here. To unlock this unit upgrade for your faction, build Sacred Woodland. This unit is upgraded from Amazon Archers. They need to be at least rank four. Upgrade cost is 990 food and 250 bronze. So you see here, there is a specific focus in this, in this campaign. You're not going to be just pumping out a bunch of top tier units because if I click on, actually, I don't think, yeah, I do, I do. I start right here. This building browser, you can see, I'm not going to have access to any units outside of the ones right here. That's how you get units is simply by making the base unit and then upgrading that base unit using the initiation rights. Let's click here. Queen Hippolyta. Yes, indeed, Hippolyta. How did I not know that it was Hippolyta and I played the camp? <sighs> Bush League, Bush League. So click this button and it shows, gives you the ability to upgrade them. But again, they have to be rank four. So that's going to really be the name of the game for both of the Amazonians is taking advantage of your royal decrees that are going to increase the effectiveness of your light infantry because all of your units that will upgrade will start as light infantry. So you want them in the game as, as long as possible with stuff like this. Increasing their melee defense and melee attack and making it so that they're cheap and easy to recruit. You're going to be focusing on that a ton. So you might as well put a lot of effort into these three technologies when it comes to uh, putting them into the battlefield. But like I said, the top portion of it is that here's a special little feat that she gets. Um, the, uh, uh, the top portion of it is that you get some very strong units in the initiation, right? So you take a look at these Aristomachoi. They're really jacked. 160 weapon strength that is very strong they also get relentless which is a really cool unit ability here they also get to the last that they're very good units so if you get anyone up to the rank it obviously stands to reason they're going to be quite strong in that rank so make sure you're really taking advantage of the initiation rights i think it's a lot of fun so when it comes down to this campaign Hippolyta's campaign is going to play a lot like all of the other Danaeans and Trojans. But what I will say is, if you want an added bit of difficulty into this, that she really starts to snowball towards the end of her campaign because she gets access to so many of these Amazonian treasures. She can kick off a lot of her um, Amazonian kingdom milestones. It really gets out of control, especially if you focus on the skills in her skill tree that do... Oh, where was it? Oh, the ones that give you special recruit. Uh -huh. So drill expert, plus one recruitment rank to all new units, and then recruitment rank of all new infantry units. So you do stuff like this, and you start to pump out higher ranked units because then you're going to go over into your uh, settlements and build stuff like this. Recruitment rank of sword units. So there are ways to circumvent the rank requirement in the initiation rights. And once you get to that point in your tech tree and in your uh, campaign, you're really gonna take off really hard and fast with Hi 
<laughs> Hippolyta, not Hippolyta, Jesus. Um, but again, this is more of a conventional style campaign. And if you want to have a different starting location that is a little more stacked against you, you're going to find that this is the one for you because no one wants to really be your friend down here. And you're going to really be at, at a lot of um, at a lot of opposition for all of these resources, especially as Sarpedon starts to move west. So you've got plenty of uh, enemies ahead of you. And again, if you want a standard conventional style campaign for the Amazons, this is going to be the one for you. Let's move over to a not so conventional campaign. For Penthesilea, I nailed it, uh, we have got some similar things, but a lot of different things. So for one, initiation rights is still active for her, just as it was prior. Now, we also get a new ability called Blood Oath, which we'll take a look at here. It gives you an ability to summon blood sworn units into the battlefield. And she is a horde army. Now, we've seen horde in Attila, in Rome, and in Total War Warhammer. This follows the Total War Warhammer model for horde, but it uh, does shore up a lot of things and makes for a very strong horde mechanic that still is a little lacking, but is much better than its original inception in Total War Warhammer. Now, again, for her, she is um, she gets access to archers, she gets access to fighters and warlords, but not to defenders. And when it comes to her unique units, she gets furies, not to be confused with the flying screeching things, uh, which are spear and shield riders, horsemen, of, uh, horsewomen of sorts, uh, javelin infantry, uh, spear and shield riders, Ipomakoi, and then the daughters of Ares, which are particularly strong two-handed axe infantry. So let's jump into her campaign and talk about some of those new mechanics. So with this campaign, you can see we start in another unique location. We are all the way to the north, just east of where Byzantium will eventually become with the Black Sea at our back. So again, a very cool, different location. No one starts this far north. The close, closest one is Aeneas down over here. So with this, we get some very interesting mechanics. So we'll click on the character and the take a look at horde buildings. So the way that this works, if you've never used a horde faction before in any total war, is all of your buildings that you would normally have in a capital or a settlement or what have you are transported along with you with the character. And these will give you bonuses on the actual campaign map. You know, 100% line to sight of 100% uh, to line of sight on a campaign map, 15% success chance to evade an ambush so on and so forth. But these will also grant you other benefits. Like if I look at this, these are all of your standard temples, right? If I look at some of these, these are the things that are gonna increase like, oh, hey, this is gonna give me income from raiding. This is gonna give me casualty replenishment rate. Or this is gonna give me a bunch of rank increases for all the units that I recruit. So building these are important. And it's also important to note that building any building requires population surplus to do so. It used to be, or I'm sorry, not used to be, on any other situation, when you're in a settlement, <clears throat> it just requires population surplus to increase this building. Well, it's just worth noting that you're gonna need that surplus to make these buildings. That's denoted right here. That's how much surplus is going to cost to make these buildings right there, right there, so on and so forth. And then if I click this button, it just goes back to a standard army where I can then recruit as I need. But it's worth noting and showing how a horde actually works in this game because Death finds us all. there are some things that are also different, like the royal decrees. The royal decrees are entirely different for this campaign and some are completely unique to her. Say, for example, the right of the mare into the horseback resilience and into horseback might. Everyone has got, or no, I'm sorry, not everyone, uh, not everyone has this layout for um, all of their actual uh, royal decrees. Even some of these too, right? This is gonna give me horde growth. This, the price of mercy, gives me resources per turn. And I would strongly recommend if you are starting this campaign, the price of mercy is very good because you also need the horde growth one, which is crucial to ensuring that your horde can continue to make more buildings. And then these three right here because you need that light infantry bonus. Again, we are dealing with an Amazon character. And as thus, you get units in the same way with your initiation rights. Now this obviously differs from Hippolyta's because this is not a archer focused faction. This is more of a 
heavy cavalry or medium cavalry focused faction. Well, you actually need light. That's that's the light symbol. So when we take a look over here on the left side, we get the Hippomaka, Hippomakoi, really strong, heavy cav. But then we also get these spear and shield riders, the Furies that we talked about a bit ago, and also this unit that is a large axe cavalry unit. So you'll be using a lot more shock cavalry and persistent combat cavalry than you were um, prior to this because that was more of an archery focused horse archer focused army so worth noting that this is an entirely different initiation rights and has different paths for everything the other two unique mechanics are war spoils which are essentially hey what am i going to get from raising the locations around the map that is the point of this army is you're a horde you're going from location to location and you are raising it you're not doing anything else you can't make certain things in those places like you could in a lot of uh horde armies in total war warhammer so if i look at war spoils and i click food all right well that's going to grant me food let me click this again uh look gives me Battle glory, which we'll go into in a second. Oh, this is going to give me battle glory. And that's denoted at this little flag on each settlement. So then if I click this symbol, this little drop, I can see Blood Oath. So the way a Blood Oath works is I have to unlock the Blood Sworn Warband. I need to get 500 total battle glory, which we'll pull up right here. Then it costs me this much money, and I can summon in these Blood Sworn Warbands. And these are particularly strong units that you can then bring into your army and I think you're limited I think at nine I think is the initial limit but as you kind of go through get more battle glory you'll get better and better and cooler units to take advantage of and it is a really cool system and this campaign itself is actually quite difficult because you it requires you to constantly be sacking and raising all of these locations across the map and I'm going to show you real quick we're going to jump ahead I'm going to show you a real quick battle that I'm going to auto resolve and I'll show you what happens when you do raise something all right, so we just sacked this city and it's time to talk about three elements. So for one, battle glory. Now this is present on the campaign map. We show that little actual feature, but I was saying, hey, I don't know what the limit is. This is where you'll find your limits. I totally forgot about this part. So let's go over real quick. So when you start off, it, you just get a bonus to the morale of your units, but you suffer upkeep penalty. And as you progress up this, you get battle glory one, two, three, four, and you'll get more morale, more campaign movement range, and an increase on your blood oath available, blood sworn unit summoned nine. So I can have up to nine in my army. So this is how you uh, will progress this meter and you'll take advantage of it as you gain more and more battle glory. But as you go to attack cities, you've got two options, raise and kill or raise and enslave. And this will differ on the amount of uh, resources that you get, but the big difference is the little icon right here. So this will give me workforce, gives me 50 battle glory. This army will regain 30% campaign movement after raising a settlement and plus 10 to horde growth. Or this one, glory from conquest plus 150 battle glory. This army will regain 30% campaign movement. And the last one here is plus 100% to administration efficiency for enacting royal decrees. So this is really good to use in the beginning portions of the game when you're trying to grow out your um, your horde buildings. But this is really strong to get really big techs quickly. So let's go ahead and press raise and kill. Raise it and, enslave their men folk. and if I take a look right here, Royal Decrees, I can see this number says 200%. So this, which would have taken me 12 turns, is taking me, I think I had like six turns left at the time of this, uh, of me starting this recording. So this, made it way faster to get this technology, and I cannot encourage this enough. Sometimes this can just auto-complete certain technologies for you, and this allows you to push through them much faster, and you're going to need them as you progress across the map. Because one thing is with uh, this campaign, you're gonna have a ton, got it, got it. You're gonna have a ton of resources a ton of resources. So people are going to constantly be annoying you to trade with them and do trade uh, barter agreements and stuff like that. You can take advantage of it, and I think you probably should to get uh, certain buildings, but you will not be hurting for resources as you sack and destroy each one of these. So that kind of sums up this campaign, and the big thing is, you know, is this right for you? Well, if you want to be a marauding Amazonian, destroying the northern portion of Greece before moving down into either Anatolia or Greek actual, Greece actual, then 
it's going to be a lot of fun. But I will say the big problem with this is these locations I already raised. This one, oh, I didn't raise this one. These two I've already raised. This, these three I've already raised, and they're already resettled. So it can be a kind of a pain in the ass to constantly have to deal with creating a power vacuum. This location only had these three settlements, and I just gave him a fourth bay, more or less. So you basically kind of have to, if you're going to go in on someone, don't get pulled into multiple wars. Like I did in the first couple times I played this campaign, I kept getting pulled into three or four wars. Just focus on one person, completely destroy them, then the next and the next and the next. Because you're going to have to keep constantly working around yourself, and it's really annoying. So while this campaign is a lot of fun, I think that Hippolyta's campaign is more enjoyable because it has the dependability of not having to deal with the constant leapfrogging of people taking over locations that you just raised. Of course, you kind of want that to happen, right? So you have more targets to raise and get more money, but it can get a little boring if you're just in the same like 15, 20 locations raising them in a circle. So I will say that while a fun campaign, I think it's missing some elements that prevent people from quickly settling them and making it so that you're again not running in a circle. But hopefully now you have a better understanding of how both of these campaigns play out. While they are fun in their own ways, I really think Hippolyta's shines out way, way, way ahead of the other, but just because of the reliability of the campaign. It is way more difficult just because of how stacked the enemies are against you, but once you get going, like I said earlier, you can really snowball out of control. So go ahead and let me know in the comment section below if you have any questions about either one of these or if you want to say, hey, you know, actually I played the DLC and I found that um, Hippolyta's is garbage and this one's way better if you do this, this, and this. Please try to share as much information as you can about these campaigns to make it for make it so that anyone who's brand new or just trying this out for the first time has a better approach to them and maybe doesn't get as, you know, washed out by difficulty or campaign mechanics that uh, would seem a little repetitive or anything of the sort. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.